an oddly specific number, so. Pardon me? Usually it's in units of 20, so I don't know why it's 37, but. Thirty-seven is a lot more than zero. So, Yay. all right. Well, while this is kicking on, I'm just going to check everybody off here. Kip and Carol are here. I am here. Bethany is here. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Six. Okay. Now I just got to pay attention to Facebook. All right. So a few announcements to share. Um, I'm, I kind of mentioned it, but to start off with the praise. Um, the Sunday Breakfast Mission has committed um, at least 37 boxes of food to help with our Thanksgiving meals. So that is a huge blessing. They weren't sure, based on how donations were coming in, they weren't sure if they'd have enough to send over here or not. But thank God they do. So amen for that. Um, <coughs> if you would like to support the, pan the, the Sunday Breakfast Mission, there are a couple ways you can do that. Um, they have the, the food baskets that they give out, which is kind of what we were just talking about. But they also do a hot Thanksgiving meal for anybody who needs to. Because um, remember, the, one of the main ministries of the Sunday Breakfast Mission is to care for the homeless. So it costs about $2.17 to feed a person Thanksgiving dinner. I think that's what it was last year, too. Yeah, they've kept the number pretty low. Mm -hmm. So... If you are interested in making a donation to the Sunday Breakfast Mission, the best way is to go directly to their website, sundaybreakfastmission.org, and you can make a donation there. Um, as far as the food pantry, um, they have these bags made up, which I love this, and we should, we should find out where they get these and get some for our pantry, but um, there's a list of the foods that they use for their Thanksgiving boxes. So if you would like to donate food to the Sunday Breakfast Mission, you can put them in these bags, we have them out in the foyer, and then we'll send them with Pastor Tom, and they'll go to support the pantry, um, sorry, to support the Sunday Breakfast Missions Pantry. You can also make donations to our pantry. Um, right now, it's kind of open season on donations, I think. Um, we are low on soup again. Um, a couple seasonal specific items that we can use for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, cranberry sauce and pie filling are two. Stuffing. Yeah, stuffing. Well, we give stuffing every month, but cranberry sauce and pie filling are ones that we especially try to have for Thanksgiving. Um, but it's boxed stuffing and either boxed instant potatoes or canned potatoes, those are our big needs. Yeah. Canned vegetables, yeah. yeah. Um, canned yams, yeah. So basically the whole shebang. We can use whatever anybody wants to bring. Cody's on with us. Hello, Cody. Good to see you, brother. So those are needs for both the Sunday Breakfast Missions Pantry and our pantry. And we encourage donations to either or both. Um, no favorites in the kingdom, right? Um, they do have a, a little bit bigger of an operation over the Sunday Breakfast Mission. I'm pretty sure they fed over a thousand people last Ooh. Thanksgiving. Wow. So. They've got a pretty big operation there, which is why they're able to help us so much, too. Um, so there are those things going on. Um, I shared the praise about that. Um, on a slightly less cheerful note, um, we are having the services for Deborah Cauley here at our church. They're going to be held on Saturday, November 5th. So not this coming Saturday, but the next Saturday. And they're going to be from... It looks like 12 to 2. There's a very slight chance that time might change. But right now we're planning on 12 to 2. We'll have a, a memorial service here in the sanctuary and then um, a luncheon in the gym. So if anybody is interested or able in helping to set up for that, or if you'd like to bring a dessert or something to share, you can check in with me. And um, we'll make sure that we let Barbara and Jamie know. Um, so Saturday the 5th, here at the church, okay? A um, few other announcements. Um, for anybody who signed up for Momentum, I sent out a group email today. So please check your emails and reply to that. We're just double checking who's going and we need to arrange carpooling. Um, I was willing to drive if we have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight seats. -ish. Yeah, so that's the plan right now is that Jill and I are going to be taking our van, and 
Diane's going to be driving her SUV, and, and between seven. those, we think we can fit them. Yeah, so it's like we seven, eight, if we put somebody in the back cargo space, which I'll do, but if we could meet you up somewhere, that way you don't have to come all the way in here mm -hmm. from there. If you just get with her, meet her somewhere, we can transfer one person over to you guys. Yep, that's the plan. Yeah, so so plan, and she wants to be exactly dressed as possible. Yep. So the, the one thing we need to know, if anybody's planning on driving themselves, that'll change our count. So just check those emails and get back to me. Um, Zone Revival is coming up. It starts this coming Sunday, okay? So Sunday, October 30th through Wednesday, November 2nd, we are holding revival services. That means that for those days, we are not having any evening services here. So after tonight, We've got a week off with no evening services, okay? So Sunday, October 30th, there will be no evening service here. Um, Monday, the 31st, there will be no men's group here. Tuesday, the 1st, there will be no women's ministries. And Wednesday, the 2nd, there will be no prayer meeting and Bible study here. Um, all of those nights, we're having combined services at Bridgeton Church of Nazarene on West Park Drive. For anyone who's not able to join in person, they are streaming those services live on their um, website. So you can, uh, if you're not able to drive, I know with work schedules and everything, sometimes it's hard to get over there in time, especially all four nights. So, um, yeah. We have um, the first night, Sunday night, Pastor Chris Peden is speaking. Uh, Monday night, Pastor Desiree Bird from Millville speaks. Tuesday night, Pastor Shane Ross from Pittman is speaking. He's new to our zone this year, so you might not have met him yet. It'd be a great chance to meet him. And then Wednesday the second, Pastor Kerry is going to be speaking. So uh, we got a great lineup. There are going to be different worship teams each night. Um, I know that Jill's going to be singing one or two nights, and I believe I may have committed to play the djembe at least one night. So. Um, you'll have lots of uh, people you recognize up front. Pastor Matt is going to be helping with that too, so you'll see he, he and Lindsay will be involved. So uh, it's a great time to get together and see our friends. So um, that's about it for the zone revival. We got an email yesterday. The district has decided to cancel the NYI Olympics. Um, you guys know we didn't have a whole lot of lead time finding out about this, so it was kind of hard for the students to make it work. So they decided that they're going to cancel it and try to schedule something a little further out that we have more time to publicize and get signups for. So I know that was confusing because we just announced it on Sunday, but um, that is going to be postponed slash canceled. Couple dates to put down on your calendar for later. Um, Tuesday, November 15th is our November prayer crawl. Uh, Saturday, November 19th are the Salem County breakfasts, the Salem County Men for Christ and Women for Christ. And December 17th, which is also the same day as Food Pantry for December, we are going to go Christmas caroling. Um, and that's going to be, the Christmas caroling will be our prayer crawl, excuse me, for December. So we'll be praying in each of the houses we sing at. And we're hoping to maybe get to visit uh, some of our pantry friends. I don't want to spill the beans because we're still trying to figure it out, but we're hoping we can make that work. What day is the, uh, the, the prayer breakfast? November 19th, 19th, Saturday, November 19th. And where are the men meeting? Um, the Scott and Donna one, men. Yep. Uh, the men are at Penns Grove Assembly of God, and the women are, yeah, it's the Bushes of Blessings Church. Um, and I forget where the women were. I announced it on Sunday, but it's on the PowerPoint. Oh, CLC. Yes, yes, CLC. On Thank the you. Okay. Yes, where is the Penns Grove Assembly of God? On Georgetown Road. Oh. Oh, Road right Corpus Christi. Oh, okay. I know where Corpus Christi is. Yeah. Right across the street. From oh, the okay. Right, right across the street. There we go. Thank you. You're welcome. I always count on a bus driver to tell me where to go. So. 
You knew where we had bushes of uh, Well, yeah, but I don't know how to tell people there. In my head, I go to the intersection by DuPont, and then I drive down the train tracks, and I go around the circle. Like, that's how I remember. <laughs> I don't know the names of any of the roads. One of them's 130, but... I don't, yeah, I don't know. Road. Yeah, I don't know the names of it. I just you know. Make a right on Georgetown. I go to DuPont, I turn right. Deepwater Diner's on my right, the train tracks are on my left, I know I'm going the right direction. Turn right to Persian I get to the circle, I go by the Sicilian pizza place. I don't know the names of any of the roads though. That's called a roundabout. Yeah. I call it a zoom zoom. But. Yeah, Jane just said CLC. Thank you, Jane. You guys are always keeping me straight. I should write it on my slip, but I didn't. All right, um, what other announcements do we need to make? I mentioned Revival. Oh, we talked about the Sunday breakfast mission. I do want to remind everybody, if you would like to get a box of food from the Sunday breakfast mission, this is a little more for our web friends, but um, if you call them on November 7th, you can reserve a box of food and a turkey. The number for that is 302-652-652. 8314 and that's on their website as well but they're asking people to call on November 7th to register so they can make sure they have enough boxes for anyone who would like to participate in their evangelism training that's going to be on Thursday November 17th at 5 30 p.m. so if you'd like to volunteer at the food distribution you need to be at that training but also anybody else who would like to come and have that evangelism training Pastor Tom has opened it up to anyone who'd like to come to that class. It's free, and Pastor Tom is teaching it, so you know the person teaching it. So it's not too scary. <laughs> um, and then they are going to be distributing their food on the Monday and Tuesday of Thanksgiving week. So right after we do our distribution, they're doing theirs. Give me that number again, please. 302-652-8314. I believe that is the main switchboard number. Um, November 7th, we call. Yep, so if you want to reserve a box, call on November 7th, um, and then you can go and pick it up on either that Monday or that Tuesday. Okay. All right, I think that covers all of our announcements. Anything else anybody can think of? All right. Well, I have some prayer requests to share. So I got text messages coming in here. Um, we have some international prayer requests, so I'll start with those. And then after that, that'll give our online friends some time to uh, post any of their requests. Tonight, we are praying for another country in Africa. We are praying for Malawi, which is Malawi, M-A-L-A-W-I, which is just on the other side of the Great Rift Valley from Zambia, who we prayed about last week. So Zambia and Malawi straddle the Great Rift Valley. It's like a, well, kind of like guess you could say the Grand Canyon, although theirs was formed more by plates moving than by water. Um, but that's where the, the big waterfalls were that we talked about last week. They fall into that big valley. So, um, so yeah, so Mali is in the southern half of Africa. It's in the, in the southeastern part of Africa. Um, the Church of the Nazarene began its work in Malawi in 1957, so a good while ago. Um, it is defined by its highlands that are split by the Great Rift Valley and by the enormous Lake Malawi. So I've never been to Lake Malawi, but it sounds beautiful. There are lots of pictures online of it, too, if you want to check it out. Um, Malawi has a population of approximately 19.1 million people, and the official language is English. The Nazarene Theological College of Central Africa is located in the capital city of Lilongwe, where current and future ministers are being developed. Nazarene Compassionate Ministries has three holistic child development programs operating in Malawi, which serve 316 children from both the community and from pastors' families. The Church of the Nazarene in Malawi has 43,000 468 members. There are 263 fully organized churches and 248 not yet fully organized churches. And they have five districts. 
They have 146 district licensed pastors and 141 ordained ministers. There are currently four missionaries serving in Malawi. So you might know their numbers are a little bit like um, Zambia that we prayed for last week, that um, they've got approximately 287 pastors who are either licensed or ordained, but they've got over 500 churches. So they have a desperate need for pastors. So any pastors listening, if you want to go to an English-speaking country, there you go. Um, they have some prayer requests and some concerns, like usual. They pray for the church planting efforts in the urban centers. They ask that we would pray for the church across Malawi as they face difficult financial challenges. And they also ask for us to pray for many young people to respond to God's call to missions. Some of their praises, they praise God for a successful national youth camp that took place in Salima in the Lakeshore District, which I believe is on the shore of Lake Malawi. They praise God for the numerical growth the church has experienced, and they praise God for the commitment of Jesus film teams in evangelism and church planting. So we've talked about the Jesus film a little bit, but just in case you, you didn't hear that, um, Jesus film teams, they put a team together and they get these backpacks to have all the equipment they need to set up an outdoor theater, basically. It has a projector and a screen and speakers, and we have the Jesus film, which is kind of like the same idea as The Chosen, but a little more, it's, it's strict to the gospel. It doesn't have any extra stuff. Um, it's the story of the Gospels. It's the Gospel story of Jesus, and it ends with a salvation message. And um, the, it's pretty cool, the setup they have, the screens that they use, you can actually see from both sides. Oh, wow. So they project on the one side, but you can see the picture from both sides. Oh. So people can kind of crowd all around these screens, and they're set up so that you can wear these backpacks and you can hike or ride a motorcycle if you need to to get from town to town or village to village. And they also have a small generator with them. So now they're actually transitioning to solar panels and batteries. By the way. So they're completely self-contained. So they can go to a village that has no electricity, and they can set up this mobile theater, outdoor theater, and give the gospel message. So it's really cool. Um, they have their own website, Jesus Film Harvest Partners. And they have lots of different videos and testimonies on there. If you're looking for a way to maybe inspire your prayer time for missions, that could be a great way to check it out. They have a Facebook group too. So you can see pictures of these um, ministries in progress and you can hear testimonies of people who've heard from them. We had one just a few months ago. Do you remember we were talking about a, a group that had been kidnapped? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the kidnappers saw the Jesus film and released the people they had kidnapped? <laughs> yeah. So uh, they're, they're operating all around the world. Um, one of the things that goes to their donations is to help keep translating the Jesus film into new languages. And the goal is to have the Jesus film in every major world language so that they can show it anywhere and have it in a language people could understand. And they're, they call it their heart language. Right. Yeah. Um, I, can't, I can't even fathom how many different languages there are. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean... <clears throat> A lot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and some countries like Papua New Guinea, they have, I think, over a hundred different dialects. Yeah, yeah. So that's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yeah. So it's a separate ministry altogether. It is. It's a big ministry. It's a lot like William Tyndale and the revival translators back in the day. And yeah. Yeah. So that's if that, if you're looking for a way to pray for world missions. Um, of course, we're praying for Malawi specifically tonight, but the Jesus Film Project is another great way to pray. Oh, Eric is on with us. So we have Eric, Jane, and Cody on with us online. So that's good. Um, they have a testimony here about a women's conference that they held at the Bangwe Church of the Nazarene in Blantre, Malawi, in the South District. Um, they held it back in September, and... Their theme was, I cannot go back, from, Naz from Nehemiah 
There were about 600 women from five different districts at the conference. The guest speaker was Dr. Audrey Malongo from the Northeast District in South Africa. And the women were taught how to support and lead in God's work and to support pastors. Um, to be ambassadors of Christ by sharing the message of holiness to people in their respective communities. They were encouraged to be good examples in their families by living out what they profess. That's good discipleship right there, right? Living out what we believe. So um, we're very thankful. Um, they also did some practical women's empowerment classes. They taught women how to care for chickens and how to bake different kinds of food. So, um, you know, you chicken is a good investment. Chickens alive or dead? Alive. Okay. Chickens are a good investment. Chickens and dairy goats are two animals that these empowerment classes often teach people how to care for because they are sustainable income sources. You know, if you eat a chicken for meat, you get one meal out of it. But if you have a chicken that lays eggs, yeah. well, then you can make banana bread. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's about helping local women um, have sustainable sources of income. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. What? They have chickens that lay bananas. Chickens that lay bananas? No, they have bananas, so they just need the eggs. <laughs> Um, but I thought that was an interesting little detail, you know. We're, we're teaching discipleship, but we're also caring for practical needs. It's a lot like what we're doing with our pantry or with the Sunday night meals, right? Mm -hmm. We're sharing the gospel, but we're also helping to meet the compassionate needs of the people around us. And food is a need everywhere around the world. So, that was some beautiful stuff there. All right, local prayer requests. Um, I mentioned that we're going to be holding... Uh, Deborah Cawley's funeral on the 5th, so please pray for their family, um, especially for Kelly and Barbara and for Deborah's son, Jamie. Um, and they have a big family, but there's a few names in particular to keep in your prayers. Um, do we have others? Please. I've been praying for our children a lot. I, uh, they all know Jesus. Don't believe that they're um, serving him the way that they used to. Our daughters, uh, as you know, have both lost their husbands, and I just pray that they don't go the wrong way. And I pray the Holy Spirit speaks to our boys because they're all born again Christians. And even Lise has. Uh, Asked us to please pray for her husband. He has to go through a mom test. Yeah, uh, Cisco. Yep. It was really nice to get to pray with him when we went and visited the house. Yeah. 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 Just so we all get it, I think we might have talked about this before Facebook was streaming. But pray for Helene, a friend of Darlene's. She had surgery and had some um, some complications, but is home now and doing better. Is that fair to say? So please pray for Helene. Um, we do have a couple of unspoken requests. Um, one for a health concern, and one for a concern for a young person who's going through a difficult season. So please lift them up in your prayers. Um, we have another unspoken uh, for a family that's going through a difficult situation, um, and particularly for the kids involved in that family. Um, I'm asking for prayers for my extended family. Um, my cousin Michelle passed away last week in a car accident, and um, there was one other person killed in that accident as well. She was driving one car and there was one person in the other car and they were both killed. Um, Michelle leaves behind three kids and um, her daughter is expecting a baby in December. Mm -hmm. And the other driver had a daughter who is about 10. So Michelle's kids were a little bit older. They're in their, I think they're all in their 20s right now. Um, but uh, yeah, hard situation. This was the accident. It was on the news, but it was on the parkway last Friday night. So you might have seen it 
my names, but please pray for, for them. Um, Michelle's kids are um, Joey, Zach, and Corinne, and the daughter of the other woman, her name, her name is Brooklyn. I'm not sharing last names because we're talking about minors a little bit here, but I'm sure if you look, if you Google it, you'll know what I'm talking about. She's fine, but the person that hit her left the scene. Uh, yeah, and then just coming through Pensgrove at the red light by um, Rite Aid there, there was an accident as I was coming here. It, the people were standing around, it didn't look like any of them were hurt, so. But usually accident aches come the next day. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that reminds me, we had a praise slash concern from Charlie. Um, Megan had a car accident last week. Um, she and, and the boys were in the car. They're all okay. Uh, just bumps and bruises, but the car was totaled. So thank God with just bumps and bruises. Um, but there is a hardship now because she needs to find another vehicle. So please try for me. What was that? They don't make cars like they used to. Well, that's true. There's Although they were protected from injury, so um, <clears throat> you know that's a good thing. Just more expensive. Yeah. Also, um, please pray for um, Charlie's son Ryan and his wife Zena. They are expecting a baby. Um, number that's number twelve for Charlie. He said oh. twelve grandkids. Well, okay for the family. No, no, it'll be number three for Ryan and Zena. Well. They have, I believe, they have two boys. And the new baby is, they're expecting a girl. Um, but she's due in about a week. So really any time now she can have a baby. But so far, everything's been good with tests and ultrasounds and stuff. So we're praying for a very uneventful pregnancy, right? Very uneventful delivery. But yeah, please keep Ryan and Zena in your prayers as well as Megan and her kids. And Charlie's very excited because he gets to do pop-up duty, so he's waiting by the bat phone for the call to go and take care of the boys. So he's really excited about it. Um, Charlie's also got some medical stuff coming up. Um, it looks like he's going to be having cataract surgery soon. So he gets some, he'll have a new twinkle in his eyes pretty soon. Um, so please keep him in prayers for that. Um, our folks online, if you have any prayer requests to share with us, please let us know. Do we have any others for here in the room? We need to continue praying for Daryl. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so Daryl has been dealing with some complications from his condition. Um, he's got significant stomach pain that he's had for a couple of weeks now. Well, show me uh, shared with the women's group last night that he had been to the doctors. Maybe it was just on Tuesday that he went to the doctors. And uh, he was only taking, was it? Yeah, they said yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was only taking half the dose he was supposed to be taking. So maybe now that he's going to be taking the full dose, his stomach problems will straighten out. Is that right? Why was he only taking half? Because it was a line on the it was a thing the container thing, and there was a line in there, but you're supposed to tell the cap up completely. They didn't realize it was wrong. Oh, okay. So he was underdosing himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. by accident. Yeah. It's complicated because some of those medicines work different for different people, and there's side effects and lots of stuff going on. So yeah. it's been a journey for him trying to get medicine straightened out, and some of his medicine, you know, they're like his one pill, it's a twice a day pill, but it doesn't last the full amount of time, so he has to kind of time when he takes it. <coughs> so, just lots of prayer for Dal. But God's been using him really powerfully the last few weeks mm -hmm. um, in, in prayer and in evangelism. So, praise for that. Um, doesn't look like we're getting any more on Facebook. Um, 
Jean sent one in. That's what I was checking my phone for. Jean Cauley. She asked us to pray for her neighbor, Bonnie, who is in the hospital right now. I guess she had to go last week and it was a kind of an emergency thing. But please pray for her. And then we also have a prayer request. Um, I want to keep this kind of unspoken because we're on Facebook. I know some of you know who I'm talking about, but one of, uh, one of the families involved in our Sunday night program with the kids, the mother of that family is on dialysis and is waiting on a kidney transplant. So we'll keep her name private because we don't know if we have permission to share that on Facebook. But um, just for a mom who is on dialysis and is waiting for a kidney transplant. Anything else? All right, I think we are ready to pray. I'll take a peek back at Facebook. I'm sure you'll all forgive my peeking while we pray, right? All right, here we go. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the wonderful news about the food donations for the pantry. Father, thank you for providing a truckload of turkeys and thank you for providing extra canned food. Father, we know that you provide, and um, it's wonderful to see how you do it differently every, every month. And Father, I just thank you for the lesson that that teaches us, that you are here and active and caring. And even though we often can't predict how you're going to work, um, and you surprise us a lot, you always make sure we have what we need. And uh, just... I know, Father, from my heart, that has been really good. It's really been a blessing to see that happen. And uh, I just thank you that we get to be a part of it, that we get to be in the middle of this and see mm -hmm. everything that you do, that you make these donations show up, whether sometimes it's through big companies and sometimes it's through individual people. And um, sometimes we're told there's going to be no food, and then there is. And it's just you're always there, Father. And uh, help us to hold that in our hearts. Help us to hold on to that promise, Father, because we need it. Um, Father, we pray, um, well, we continue to pray for Barbara and Kelly and Jamie and Sean and the rest of their family as, as we mourn the loss of Deborah. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to celebrate her life on the 5th, that you would help us to honor her by remembering her life and help us to look forward to the hope of a final resurrection. Father, we know her faith, and I pray that when we gather together for her memorial, you would help us to share that hope with any family or friends who might not yet believe in you. Um, help us to share that, Father. We lift up some unspokens, Father, one for a person who has a health concern. We lift up a young person dealing with some complicated circumstances at school and, and at home. Father, we lift up a family that is struggling, particularly for the kids, but I guess the whole family, parents and kids, they all need your help, Father. Um, we lift up Darlene's friend, Helene. Father, we thank you that you were with her through her surgery and her complications, and that she is home now and doing better. And I thank you that you've opened a door for Darlene to help her. I pray that you continue to give Darlene the wisdom and the compassion to find all those extra people to care for. We know she and Kay are a lot alike and they collect people who need help. Mm -hmm. and thank you for giving them both a heart to care. Father, we lift up uh, Carol and Jim's children. Father, we, we know they've had a hard year with their daughters losing husbands, both within about a year here. We pray that you would be with their hearts. I think that's a prayer we have for a lot of people, Father. It seems like a lot of us have friends and family who are professing Christians, but are not really living completely for you, Father. And I pray that they get to see that blessing, that they get to experience that joy of not just 
not going to hell, but of, of living for you and living in your love and, and experiencing what that's like to be given over fully to you, Father. It's a blessing. And we want, we want all of our friends and family to have that blessing, Father. Um, we lift up Ivelisse and Cisco, Father. We pray for Cisco's body as he's going for testing. We pray for wisdom for the doctors, and we pray for peace and patience and rest for Ivelisse and Cisco. We know it's sometimes harder on the person not sick, so please be with Ivelisse during this journey. Father, we lift up the families of the two women who were killed in the car accident last week. We lift up their kids. Joey and Zach and Corinne and Brooklyn. Father, please be with their children as they mourn and are facing a life without their mothers. We know that's a very, it's hard, Father. So please be with them. We lift up Darlene's co-worker who is involved in the hit and run, Father. Um, we don't know why the person ran away, but it's usually because something bad's going on. And so we pray for their life. We pray for this other accident Darlene witnessed. It seems there's a lot of them. We lift up Megan and her kids. Father, we thank you that they were not seriously injured in their car accident. And we pray for provision for Megan for a new vehicle. We lift up Ryan and Zena to you, Father. We thank you for the gift of new life and the expectation of another grandbaby. Um, it's, it's fun to see Charlie so excited to get to have Papa Cootie and get the phone call. And, um, we just share in their joy, Father, and thank you for that. We lift up Daryl to you, Father, especially the, the complications he's been dealing with, with his stomach pain. Um, hopefully, Father, we're praying that this new discovery about his medicine might help, um, but please be with him. We lift up Jean's neighbor, Bonnie. We pray that she would um, receive the help that she needs in the hospital and that you would give her healing for her body that she would be able to come home safely. We also lift up this mother in our neighborhood who is undergoing dialysis and waiting for a kidney transplant. Father, we pray that you would care for their family as they are going through this stressful time and that you would carry her through and help her to just restore her health, Father. She needs you. We lift up our brothers and sisters in Malawi. Father, thank you for um, the children's centers that we got to read about and the women's training about evangelism and discipleship and chickens and kind of that whole care. And it, it's just a wonderful reminder, Father, that you care about all of our needs. And uh, we thank you to he that we get to hear these testimonies. And I pray, Father, that they would inspire us to do the same, that they would continue to inspire us to care for the whole person, physical needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs. Um, Father, help us to be your hands and your feet in this situation. We also especially lift up the Jesus Film, um, mm. the, the Jesus Film Project. Um, yeah, please help, Father, please help. Um, Father, we also lift up this prayer for um, a young man who passed away at 32. It's a very young age, Father, and so we pray that you would be be with his family right now in their time of loss. Um, please be with us tonight as we study your word, especially as we <coughs> read words of hope that you gave to Ezekiel, Father. Help those words of hope to be a comfort to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And patience for those of us who don't have any. Amen. He teaches us. He teaches us. But thank God he never gives up on us. Some of us are a little slow to learn. <laughs> I include myself in that list. But mm -hmm. God is good. All the time. And all the time? Yeah, good. Yeah, we got to remember that, right? I know. We gotta that I know. It's just the waiting for his timing thing. We're going to talk about that in just a minute when we get into chapter 40. Because there's a, the timing is mentioned about the where Ezekiel's at in this process and how long he's been in Babylon and and it's years and years. So, um, Eric, I'm not sure. I see your prayer request here, but I'm not sure who you're talking about. 
So I don't know if you can, if you want to explain that on Facebook, or we can get the details when you're talking. But we'll pray for that young man, for the family of the young man who passed away. Um, I, I'm, I don't think you're talking about Diane Utley. Do we have another Diane in the church? Do we know if I know if it's mine or yours? Yeah. So maybe that might have been a voice to text thing, brother. That might, that might be the wrong name. So, let us know. That was the last prayer request I added about the young man who passed away, a 32-year-old man. Okay, so we are going to finish up Ezekiel 39 tonight and then get through chapter 40. 40 is a little bit of a shorter chapter, and there's a lot of uh, explanation about building the temple. So I think 40 will go pretty quick, but I've got some bonus material at the end we're going to get into. So um, Where we left off... We had just finished talking about um, the defeat of the armies of Gog of Magog and um, the promise that through this attack and blessing, um, we'll get to see who God is. One of the details last week that struck me was that all the weapons used in this battle will be turned into... Bless you. Will be turned into firewood and it will be seven years worth of firewood for the whole country. And that they're not going to save those weapons to use in further conflict. No. They're going to burn them as firewood because they don't need them. Amen. Amen. That's a lot of firewood. It's a lot of firewood. So that's a lot of weapons. Mm-hmm. All right. So we are in chapter 39. Could somebody pick up with uh, verses 25 to 29? This is part of the same vision, but it's kind of a new section. Yeah, I can. Thank you, brother. So now this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will end the captivity of my people. I will have mercy on all Israel. For I jealously guard my holy reputation. Mm -hmm. They will accept responsibility for their past shame and unfaithfulness after they come home to live in peace in their own land with no one to bother them. When I bring them home from the lands of their enemies, I will display my holiness among them for all the nations to see. Then my people will know that I am the Lord their God, because I sent them away to exile and brought them home again. I will leave none of my people behind, and I will never again turn my face from them. Mm. For I will pour out my spirit upon the people of Israel. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. Thank you very much. That's some promise. Yeah, that is some promise, right? So let's take a moment and just rest in that. This is a big promise. Mm -hmm. There are also some important details here. One, how does verse 25 start? We have a change in time. What are the first couple words of verse 25? I will. Yeah. So... We had been talking, when we were talking about the prophecies of Gog and the armies and all that, what kind of time frame were we talking about? The future. The distant future, right? After the people have returned to the land and lived in peace and all that, right? Now we're kind of jumping back closer to Ezekiel's time. And he's saying, I will end the captivity of my people. So this is like zooming back closer to Ezekiel from the battle. Because this stuff is, this promise is something that's going to happen before that battle. Okay, so we've we went to the distant future, the battle with Gog of Magog. Now we're zooming back to where they're in captivity, which is kind of Ezekiel's present, right? God says He will end the captivity of His people and have mercy on Israel. So, if you're Ezekiel and you're sitting in Babylon, how would it feel to have God make that promise? Awesome. Hope. Hope, yeah. I mean, we can generally deal with just about anything if we know when it's going to end, right? It's the not knowing when it's going to end that makes it really hard. Right? So, um, God's saying there is going to be an end to your captivity. But something has to happen in order for this blessing to occur. Um, Verse 26, what's something that the people are going to need to do? 
acceptance of responsibility for their shame and their sins. Yeah, accept responsibility for what they've done. What kind of churchy New Testament word do we use for this? Repent. To repent, yeah. <laughs> Repentance has to be a part of the process, right? Mm -hmm. If God puts them back in the new land and they go back to doing all the things they were doing, what's going to happen? God's going to punish them again. Yeah. So in verse 25, God talks about jealously guarding his name or his reputation, right? So this is something that has come up a few times over the last couple chapters, right? That that God is not he, not going to do this because the people deserve it, but God's going to do it to restore his name. His holy name. But if he brings the people back into the land and all this happens again, what's that going to do to God's name? It will profane his name again, right? Yep. Disrespect his name, make it unholy, yeah. So God's saying, we, we've got to change this, right? We've got to change this. And just getting back into the land isn't enough, right? If you take somebody who doesn't have a license and you give them a car and they wreck it, and then you just give them another car, what's going to happen? Going to wreck it again. Hey, you got to teach them how to drive. Yeah, you can't just keep giving them cars. You got to teach them how to drive. And the same way with life, right? God, if God just keeps giving the people promised lands and temples and walls and blessings, and then they forsake the blessing, it's just going to be mess after mess after mess, right? And each time around, it gets a little bit worse. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. You know, like Abraham, when he would start to wander too far to the north, this happened a few times. Do you know what happened for God to signal him to go back? They experienced a famine. Mm -hmm. So Abraham would be traveling with his fox, and he would start to head to the north, which remember, that's not a good place for them to go. That's leaving the promised land. What's north of this? That's basically the gateway in. That's where Gog and Magog are and they come in from. Okay. That's the way out of the land. Right? So to the south is Egypt. To their east is wilderness. To their west is the Mediterranean Sea. And so north is the way you use to travel in and out of the Holy Land. So every time Abraham would start to creep that way, like he was going to head to a different area, they experience a famine. Oh, okay, now we need to go back. So a little, a short-term famine, and then they head back. Now we're all the way up to like a city, cities destroyed, and thousands of people dead. The temple burned. You know, prisoners of war. Each time, it gets worse. Right? Each time it gets worse. Um, Let's say they get into the new land and they confess their shame and unfaithfulness and they live in peace. What's going to keep them from going back into their old patterns? Um, a call back to a couple chapters. A gift that God said he was going to send them. A shepherd, a good shepherd. A good shepherd. That was one of the reasons they got into this mess, right? The leaders were not leading the way they should. They led the people astray. They made the pot a little rusty. Right? Yeah. Good, good, good. Um, they will know that I am the Lord because... Can somebody reread verse 28 for us? Because I sent them into exile among the nations and then gathered them into their own land, I will leave none of them behind. Yeah. Half of that sounds really good, right? Coming home, nobody left behind. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. The exile part. How's that sound? Not so good. Not so good, right? And is the exile over yet? No. Not yet. No. I know this isn't in Ezekiel, but in Jeremiah, God does give a time frame for the for the exile. Do you remember how long? Forty years. Seventy years. Seventy years. Yeah. Longer, right? Mm -hmm. When they wandered in the wilderness during the Exodus. That was 40 years. Right. Basically one generation. Now, it's going to be 70 years. Like two generations. See, it goes up each time. Right? It gets worse each time. Um, 
Now, we mentioned the Good Shepherd. There's also another blessing. In verse 29, God promises to pour out something upon the people. His Spirit. His Spirit. Yeah. So if we call back to, to chapter 37, when Ezekiel saw the valley of the dry and scattered bones, what happened to those bones to give them life? God's Spirit was breathed into them, right? Yeah. So this receiving God's Spirit and receiving the Good Shepherd, you know, the reception of the Spirit is how they come to life again, and the receiving of the Good Shepherd is how they keep from dying again, right? If you only have one of those things, is this going to work? No. No. Now, we have a little bit of a New Testament bias because we know how the story goes, right? But ultimately, this pouring of the Spirit and the receiving of the Good Shepherd, what are we talking about? Pentecost. Pentecost is the pouring out of the Spirit. That's also mentioned in the prophet Joel. Um, Joel is who Peter quotes when he does his Pentecost sermon. Right. And who's the Good Shepherd? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. yeah. So this is, a, this is a long time coming, right? How much time was between the Testaments? Like between years? Old and New Testament, about 400 years. Yeah. Yeah. But this is several hundred years before that. Okay, so we've got the Spirit, we've got the breath, we've got the new promise. So we read chapter 39 was a, a hard chapter, right? There's lots of war and death. But it is all part of a promise, right? It's all part of a promise. The people are going to be restored, but during this restoration... It's not going to be easy. There's going to be enemies. There's going to be internal things they've got to deal with. Right? Troubles from the outside and troubles from the inside. All right. Any questions about that promise before we move into chapter 40? Okay. Um, chapter 40 starts a new, uh, a new vision. Okay. So we're just going to read a little bit to start with to get some of our background down, okay? Can somebody read chapter 40, Ezekiel chapter 40, verses 1 through 3? I'll do it. Thank you, Carol. On April 28th, during the 25th year of our captivity, 14 years have the fall of, after the fall of Jerusalem, the Lord took hold of me. In a vision from God, he took me to the land of Israel and set me down on a very high mountain. From there I could see toward the south what appeared to be a city. As he brought me nearer, I saw a man whose face shone like bronze standing beside a gateway entrance. He was holding in his hand a linen measuring cord and a measuring rod. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, new new vision, new prophecy, right? We're getting back into some familiar ideas. What's something that we see in verse 1 that we did not have in the last couple prophecies? A date. We've got a date. Yeah. Not just a date, it's very but we, specific. Yeah, we've got some extra information just to make sure we understand why that date is important, right? So, when Ezekiel receives this prophecy, this vision, how long had he been in captivity in Babylon? 25 years. 25 years. So when we first met Ezekiel, he was about 30. So now he's about 55. Right? So he was just coming into his age to be able to serve as a priest. Now he's kind of over the hump coming into his older years. Yeah, back then they didn't live that long. Yeah. Um, how long had it been since Jerusalem fell? 14. 14 years. So that gives us another, if we do the math, if, Jeru if he's been in Babylon for 25 years, but Jerusalem only fell 14 years ago, how long was he a prisoner before Jerusalem fell? 11 years. Yeah, about 11 years. So we got to keep that in perspective, right? Those early visions, that was 11 years where he's, you know, making the diorama on the ground and putting the hair in his pockets after he shaved his head and losing his wife, right? That was an 11-year period. Wow. Yeah. So 
So the first 20 books, the first 20 chapters of Ezekiel, roughly, take place during those 11 years. Then we've got the, the 14 years after that. Now he receives another vision. We don't know exactly when the visions in 37, 38, and 39 came, but it definitely slows down, right? A l most of what has come before this was during those 11 years where he was a captive but before Jerusalem fell. So from when Jerusalem fell till now, there was a lot less coming through the pipeline. Right? So he's probably been waiting a little while without a, without a word from God. Okay, so that's our time frame. Um, what kind of prophecy is this? Is he reading? Is he hearing? Is he singing? Is he going? God took him up to a high mountain, and he could see the city. And then there was a man with a measuring tool. Yeah, so God picked him up and took him somewhere. Mm -hmm. A lot like when he looked into the temple and saw what the people were doing. Right? Similar language to that vision. He sees a man. Okay, well, actually, before we get to that part, I don't know, sorry. Eric, I'm sorry, I don't understand what, the, the voice to text is not working real well here, because it said crab crisis for Luann, so something, something's not right. So I'll give you a call, and I can get those details straight over the phone. When he gets taken, where does God set him in verse 2? On top of a mountain. On top of a very high mountain. And he's looking south, and what does he see? A city. A, a city. city. So, looking from the south to a big city. We're getting some tingles here, but we don't know exactly yet what he's looking at, right? And then he sees this man that Darlene mentioned. God brings him closer, kind of like zooming in with a with binoculars, and he sees a man. What do we know about this man? First, before we get to what he's holding, what do we know about the man? His, His face, face shone like, like polished bronze. Right? So, what does that mean? Any ideas? He had a good tan. He had a good tan? Well, we're a couple steps past tan, right? Because um, polished bronze, do you know what they used polished bronze for back then? That's what they used to make mirrors, right? right? So this is like bright and shiny, oh, okay. right? Like hurt your eyes bright and shiny. Ah. Yeah. Can you think of another story in the Bible where someone's face shone like bronze? Moses. Yeah. Moses. Oh, okay. What happened in that story? Do you remember? When he was up uh, getting the commandments from God, and when he came down the mountain, his face had shined. Mm -hmm. Now, because he had seen the face of God. Right. Well, he kind of saw God's foot, maybe. But um, <laughs> there's a special word for this. Um, the Hebrew word is God's Shekinah glory. Shekinah. Right? So it's kind of like, um, it makes me think of like a glow-in-the-dark toy, right? It doesn't glow on its own, but when it receives the light from something else, then it glows. Right? So this is kind of like, You've been so close to God's glory that now that glory is shining out from you. Now, did that last forever for Moses? No, no like a, like a glow-in-the-dark toy, eventually it fizzled out, right? Now, in Revelation, Jesus' feet are described as burnished bronze. Yeah. There's also a figure in Daniel that shines like bronze. Do you know who that, what, what happened there? The figure who shines, one like, one like the Son of Man who shined like bronze? couple times. Well, it's in Daniel's vision, but it's also in the oven. Another in the fire, right? Yeah. So, this could mean a couple different things. We, we are not far into this yet, so we're still putting out our feelers, right? Doesn't the bronze signify a certain country? That, it did yeah. in the vision of the statue. Yeah, okay. But in this case, one like burnished bronze or polished bronze. We are to, that, that's, a, that's a flag for God's glory, right? So sometimes God's glory can shine off of a person like Moses, or it could signify the voice of God, the messenger of God himself, who we would 
if, if we were talking about the physical personification of God on earth, what would we call that? Mm. Jesus. So, just putting some feelers out there, just some things to think about, right? So he sees this one whose face shines like bronze. So this is God's glory. So something big is going on here, right? And he's holding a couple of things in his hand. What's he holding in his hand? Measuring rod and measuring stick. A linen measuring cord and a measuring rod. What does that sound like to you? Like a surveyor. Like a surveyor, exactly. This is their vision, their version of a tape measure and a yardstick. Right? The tools that a surveyor would use, yeah. It's too small to measure on a piece of paper. This is you're measuring bigger stuff, right? Like roads and buildings and walls, perhaps a temple that you need to rebuild. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Right? Okay, so let's see what this man speaks now. Can somebody read verse four? Thank you. The man said to me, Mortal, look closely and listen attentively, and set your mind upon all that I shall show you. For you were brought here in order that I might show it to you. Declare all that you see to the house of Israel. Thank you. All right, so she just said it, but let's put it in a little more easy English. Hey, boy. Right? Pay attention. Pay attention. Now, the, I don't want to be too flippant with this, but if you had just been grabbed by the Spirit of God in a vision, wouldn't you be paying attention? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think this figure is telling him to pay attention? Because he has a specific message for him. Yeah. Don't get too distracted by the show. You need to pay attention to the contents, right? Because this is an intense experience, right? He's just been taken by the Spirit to a new place. He's talking to somebody. Maybe it's God. Maybe it's a messenger of God. But it's intense. And this messenger is like, listen, I know this is big, but there's going to be a test, right? Pay attention. And why is he supposed to pay attention? What is his job? To tell all of Israel what he's seen. Yeah. Now, this is different. This has not been the same thing he was told every time, right? right? Sometimes the vision is for other countries. Sometimes it's for him. But this is, I'm showing you something. You need to pay close attention, and you need to tell everybody everything, right? So we know something important is coming, right? And probably going to be a lot of information. Um, as we get into this information, I'm going to give you a little hint to start off with. We're going to be talking about some measurements, right? We've got that linen measuring cord and the measuring rod, okay? The original measurements would have been in a unit called a cubit, okay? So they had hands, like the width of your hand, and that would be converted. They used things like the hand or the length of your arm or the length of your leg or your foot or your stride. That's how they defined what a cubit was. <coughs> so that was the same measurement that God gave Noah to build his ark was mm -hmm. the cubits. So that's that's the measure of that's the unit of measure they would have been using in the Old Testament, right? Um, close we, to the tabernacle. Right. So we know pretty close to what that means. And so a lot of modern translations do some of that math for us. So as we take turns reading here, I'm guessing that some of your Bibles are going to give these units in feet or in meters. Um, some of them might say cubits. So you're going to hear these different units. The reason is a lot of modern translations, a cubit, I don't know how big a cubit is, right? So like my Bible, it does translate them into feet. So you know how many feet we're talking about here. A long cubit is about 20 inches. Right. So a cubit is less than a yard, but more than a foot. Right? About two feet. Okay? About the length of your leg. Right? Well, the dictionary says from the elbow to the tip of your middle finger. Basically. Yeah. Depending on the size of the person. Yeah. So about 20 inches. Yep. 
So you see they use body like how we had feet, and it actually used to be feet because you could just walk it, but different feet are different sizes. So we've got a pretty good idea of what that is, but that's why it says about 20 inches because we don't know for sure. We can go back and look at ancient buildings where they said how many cubits it was and then we can measure it, but it's not always the same. That's why you've got a measuring rod and a measuring cord, right? So that while that person is building that project, that rod, that is the standard. A cord can stretch or break, but that rod for that project, that is the standard, right? So a lot like God's word was the standard for the people, mm -hmm. this rod is the standard for what they're about to be told, mm -hmm. okay? We're going to go a little bit faster through this next section, and I'll explain why as we go through. I'm going to take a turn real quick. I'm going to read 5 to 16, and then we'll read the rest in another chunk, okay? But I, we are, we'll button this up at the end, but we're going to read through it and then talk about it, okay? I could see a wall completely surrounding the temple area. Right, I'm going to pause already. I know I said I wasn't going to do this, but if he sees a wall in the temple... What city do you think he's looking at? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay, good. I got excited. Okay. I could see a wall completely surrounding the temple area. The man took a measuring rod that was about ten and a half feet long and measured the wall. The wall was ten and a half feet thick and ten and a half feet high. Then he went over to the eastern gateway. He climbed the steps and measured the threshold of the gateway. It was ten and a half feet from front to back. The thickness of the wall, right? Makes sense. There were guard alcoves on each side built into the gateway passage. Each of these alcoves was ten and a half feet square with a distance between them of eight and three quarters feet along the passage wall. The gateway's inner threshold which led to the entry room at the inner end of the gateway passage was ten and a half feet from front to back. He also measured the room of the gateway. It was 14 feet across with supporting columns three and a half feet thick. This entry room was at the inner end of the gateway structure facing toward the temple. There were three guard alcoves on each side of the gateway passage and each had the same measurements and the dividing walls separating them were also identical. The man measured the gateway entrance, which was 17 and a half feet wide at the opening and 22 and three quarters feet wide in the gateway passage. In front of each of the guard alcoves was a 21 inch curb. The alcoves themselves were 10 and a half feet on each side. Then he measured the entire width of the gateway measuring the distance between the back walls of the facing the back walls of facing guard alcoves the distance between was 43 and three quarters feet he measured the dividing walls along the inside of the gateway up to the entry room of the gateway this distance was 105 feet the full length of the gateway passage was 87 and a half feet from one end to the other they were, there were recessed windows that narrowed inward through the walls of the guard alcoves and their dividing walls. There were also windows in the entry room. The surfaces of the dividing walls were decorated with carved palm trees. Okay, there's a lot of information here. A couple of questions. Any observations so far about what's going on? A math headache, that's true, right? That's why you've told to pay attention, right? Because yeah. there's lots of numbers and you gotta remember these. I've got a picture. Got a, yeah, there are pictures of this. Yeah. So. What is he seeing? <clears throat> what are we describing the measurements of in this section? Of the new temple that will be restored. Well, before the this is the wall, right? The wall. The wall. The, gateway. the wall and the gates, right? What happened when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem? He tore the temple. He destroyed the temple. Well, we're not to the temple yet. He destroyed the walls too, right? Yeah. So these walls, when Ezekiel's hearing this vision, they don't exist. They've been destroyed. 
In this vision, what is he seeing? Walls. New walls, completed walls. Yeah, interesting, right? Yeah, so we're starting with the outside, and he's kind of coming towards it, and he starts by observing the wall. We've got the description of the gates where you come in, and the guard alcoves on either side of the gates, the distance between the alcoves. So you, you could do this. It's a repeating pattern, right? So you can figure out about how big the wall is. I can't do all the math on top of my head, but these numbers, you know how, you know how big the wall is, how big the gate is, how big the guard, guard alcoves are, and the distance between the alcoves, and you rinse and repeat. There's 12 gates, right? So he's seeing the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem. What did a wall symbolize for a city back then? Protection. Protection. Security. Security. Yeah. <clears throat> this is what kept you safe. Yeah. So God was giving him more or less a blueprint to let the people of Jerusalem know what specifications. Let's stick a want. pin in that question. Let's read the next section, and we'll come back to your blueprint question then, okay? Okay. Because we got a little more to read, but that's a really, really good question. But we don't have enough information yet to answer you. Okay? okay? But we'll get it. Any other observations here? Math headache, mm -hmm. big wall, nice and fancy, decorated with palm trees. Yay? Okay? Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I, the word is not in this dictionary, but it says uh, the NIV says narrow parapet openings. Yes, so window opening is the one, is the the, what mine used. A parapet was a specific kind of window that was used for archers. And so basically it's a kind of window that is wider on the inside than the outside. You know how for us our window frames on the sides are parallel? Right? So you can look through and open a window up and down. A parapet is trapezoid shaped. So basically if you were on the inside there's only a very narrow hole so if you're trying to shoot arrows from the outside, it's a narrow opening. But if you're on the inside, you can swing to either end, and you can shoot arrows over to the left mm -hmm. and over to the right, but still have cover from the wall. Mm -hmm. So a parapet is a defensive window. Mm -hmm. okay? We see them in castles all the way through the medieval years. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's even how they design some tanks and forts and things now. Uh, those windows are made so they're wider on the inside, so you can shoot out. Good question. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, would somebody like to take a shot at reading one of these, or would you guys like me to do it? I'm going to warn you ahead of time, it's a big chunk. I'm not trying to scare you away. What do you think, Miss Darling? You feel like you're up to a chunk? Yeah. Why don't you start at 17, and when you run out of breath, we'll, 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 we'll leave you. Okay. Um, if you can, go all the way to 37. Okay. Then he brought me into the outer court. There were chambers there and a pavement all around the court. Thirty chambers fronted on the pavement. The pavement ran along the side of the gate, corresponding to the length of the gate. This was the lower pavement. Then he measured the distance from the inner front of the lower gate to the outer front of the inner court, 100 cubits. Then he measured the gate of the outer court that faced north, its depth and width, its recesses, three on either side, and its plaster, mm -hmm. and its vestibule were of the same size as those of the first gate. Its depth was 50 cubits, and its width was 25 cubits. Its windows, its vestibule, and its palm trees were of the same size as those of the gate that faced toward the east. Seven steps led up to it, and its vestibule was on the inside. Opposite the gate on the north, as on the east, was a gate to the inner court. He measured from gate to gate, 100 cubits. Then he led me toward the south, and there was a gate on the south, and he measured its pilasters, and its vestibule, and they had the same dimensions as the others. There were windows all around in it and in its vestibule, like the windows of the others. Its depth was 50 cubits, and its width was 25 cubits. There were seven steps leading up to it. Its vestibule was on the inside, 
It had palm trees on its pilasters, one on either side. Boy, this is detailed. It is. Well, maybe. Keep going. There was a gate on the south of the inner court, and he measured from gate to gate toward the south, 100 cubits. Then he brought me to the inner court by the south gate, and he measured the south gate. It was of the same dimensions as the others. Its recesses, its pilasters, and its vestibule were of the same size as the others, and there were windows all around in it and in its vestibule. Its depth was 50 cubits, and its width, 25 cubits. There were vestibules all around, 25 cubits deep and 5 cubits wide. Its vestibule faced the outer court, and palm trees were on its pilasters, and its stairway had eight steps. That's weird. Then he brought me to the inner court of the east side, and he measured the gate. It was of the same size as the others. Its recesses, its pilasters, and its vestibule were of the same dimensions as the others. And there were windows all around in it, and in its vestibule, its depth was 50 cubits, and its width 25 cubits. Its vestibule faced the outer court, and it had palm trees on its pilasters on either side, and its stairway had eight steps. Then he brought me to the north gate, and he measured it. It had the same dimensions as the others. Its recesses, its pilasters, and its vestibule were of the same size as the others, and it had windows all around. Its depth was 50 cubits and its width 25 cubits. Its vestibule faced the outer court and it had palm trees on its pilasters on either side and its stairway had eight steps. All right, thank you. That was just like totally repetitive. Okay. Each section was the exact same except for the first one had seven steps and then after that they had eight steps. Mm -hmm. So you have specific measurements with specific designs and specific locations. Yeah. That, that sounds like a blueprint to me. Sounds like a blueprint? Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm going to ask a question now. Have you ever built a house or been a part of a building project? Yeah. Yeah. If I were to say, Jim, I want you to build a house and I want it to be 60 feet wide and 80 feet deep, I want it to have eight steps and have windows all around with palm tree decorations. What's a pilaster? Uh, the guard alcove. Ah. The guard rooms. But if I gave you that information, would that be enough for you to build a house? No. Yeah. You know, how far apart are the studs going to be? Do you want sheetrock? Is it vinyl siding? How many it... rooms do you want? Yeah. yeah do. So it does sound like a ton of information, mm -hmm. but is it actually enough information to fully build the building? Mm -hmm. No. So why, why would that matter? Why would you give somebody all these details, but not enough to actually build it, but enough that it's a, a ton of details? Why do you think a vision would have this kind of information? That's because what that's it a, is, it's a vision. Because that's a start. That's a, a start. starting point, and it's a foundation for what is coming. It's a foundation, right? It's a foundation. Found out the walls and the gates, and here's the foundation. Here's the size, right? When you're given the rough dimensions of a house, that's not the dimension you give the finished carpenter, right. but that's the kind of dimension you'd give the, the contractor doing the site work, the guy who's digging the basement and pouring the footings, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we don't have all the final details, right? We don't know what color carpet they want in the hallway, mm -hmm. but this, these numbers, these dimensions, this is what you need for the foundation to start the building. Yeah, interesting. Okay. The, the plumber and the electrician, they're gonna get more details, but the guy who's digging the basement and pouring the footings, he just needs the dimensions, right? And we're gonna shoot the elevations, so I need to know is there gonna be a front step, back step, walk out basement? So the seven steps and eight steps, well then that starts to be important, right? How high is it going to be on each side based on the dirt? See? You're getting interesting, right? Interesting. We're running a little short on time, so we're not going to get to everything I planned, but I want to read. Um, do we stop here? Yeah. Yeah, we'll stop here. 
We'll stop here. There's a little bit more detail to read here in chapter 40. And then what we're going to do, um, not next week, because next week is the revival, but the week after. So this will be on the 10th, November 10th, 10th, 9th, November 9th. Um, we're going to finish chapter 40, and then we're going to compare this, right? Because here's something I want to remind you. Are they building a brand new temple that's never been built before? No. no. What are they doing? Restoring the old. Yeah. yeah. Now, is there much left of the old temple? No. No. No, the foundation stones. But that's about it. Right? So, they're not building from scratch, right? Um, but, there really isn't, the structure is gone. Right? Um, so we've got, we're going to go back to when they built the first temple and look about, look at that a little bit. We're not going to compare number for number. I'm not going to suck your brains out, right? <laughs> but just some basic details, right? You mean when Solomon built it? Yes, which is the temple that got destroyed. We're going to talk about building the temple that's already been destroyed. And then we're going to jump into Ezra and Nehemiah and look a little bit about this rebuilding process as it happened, all right? Because we've just heard a bunch of details, yeah. but this leaves me with a really big question. What would your question be? They did rebuild it. They did rebuild it, because but did they, they listen? Mm -hmm. They rebuilt it, but did they follow what Ezekiel said? Probably not. Well, I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to wait or read Ezra and Nehemiah. But that's my, that was my big question, right? Ezra and Nehemiah... They, they were kind of in charge of things as the people came back and rebuilt. They rebuilt the wall, they rebuilt the temple. Ezra talks about the rebuilding of the temple. Nehemiah focuses on the rebuilding of the wall. But did they listen to this? Right? Because honestly, if they already built the temple once, what would be the easiest way to give people instructions? Do what you did last time. Do what you did last time, right? Why didn't God just say, do what you did last time? Well, that's the simple answer, right? Because you don't want to, right? Because he's God. He wanted he said, something different. He wanted them How did they get all the building materials for the first temple? Solomon got them. David and Solomon, right? Yeah. The two strongest kings ever. Are they in that same situation now? No. no. Nope. Not at all. Nope, nope, nope. They don't have the bankroll they had the first time. They don't have the contractors they had the first time, right? There were a couple men who God, it said God poured out his spirit on them to give them special skills. Yeah, the, the bronze and metal workers. Mm -hmm. and yeah. 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 So there's some interesting things going on. Different people, different skills, different materials, but they still need a temple. Yeah. That first temple, it was really fancy. Right? Lots of gold, lots of bronze. It wasn't as fancy as Solomon's house, though, now was it? Well, that's true. And we'll get into that a little bit next time. But, it, you know, the amount of gold and silver is numbered, but it said they used so much bronze that they didn't even, they couldn't even tell you how much they used. It was so much. Hmm. Um, and the fancy woods from different countries and, and pottery and all, all, it had an indoor pool. Seriously, it had an indoor pool. It was hmm. called the sea. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was held up by these big bronze bulls. Yeah, yeah, it was what they used for the ceremonial cleansing of the priests. Yeah. Wow. So maybe indoor pool is not quite the right word for it, but you get what I'm saying. And um, heaven's going to be better. Yeah, the one in heaven. Yeah. So okay. we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to kind of button some of these pieces together. The what was it like the first time around? What did we just read in chapter 40 of Ezekiel? And do they follow that? Two weeks, not next Two week. weeks, yes, two weeks. Is bronze worth uh, any money today? What is it worth today? Oh, bronze is worth money. Think about recycling, right? Uh, have you ever done scrapping? Right, so you've got your ferrous metals. Nowadays, they're the cheapest. Back then, they, didn't, they couldn't work steel. So that, but when you get into non-ferrous metals, um, you've got aluminum, like cans. That's worth good. Then, then you get up to um, copper and bronze and brass, right, yeah. right? and they're worth even more. People so today, steel bronze and copper and brass, it's not worth as much as gold and silver, but it's worth a lot more than like yeah. iron, like a, 
has to like shred like a washer that you're recycling. So even now, with all of our technology, bronze and brass and copper, bronze is brass and copper mixed together. But those metals even now are worth more than you know what, what you would use to make appliances or a car or that kind of stuff that you'd recycle, a cast iron gate or whatever. So even now, that's it's worth more. So it's what you would probably call a semi-precious metal. You know, it's not gold, but it's worth more than just tin. Yeah. So back then, you kind of had copper and then bronze and then um, silver and then gold. That's kind of like a rough scale. Where did platinum fit in? They, I don't think they really had platinum back then. No. <laughs> um, because platinum has to be refined in ways that I don't think they had the technology for. How did they Same reason they didn't have aluminum. How did they refine these metals? They melt them. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at, um, if you go through the history of people back then, first you have the, the copper age, right? Mm -hmm. And why do you think it started with copper? At the lowest melting point. Right? It was easiest to melt. And then you get up, well, first you start with the Stone Age. You know, they made stone tools first. Then they learn how to make copper. Then they learn how to make bronze, which is important because bronze is harder than copper. So if you've got a copper sword and I've got a bronze sword and we whack them together, I win, mm -hmm. right? Or if you've got a copper shield and I've got a bronze sword, I can poke through it. But that's also why iron gets more important. And there, where we're dealing with, like in King David's time, they were just in that transition from bronze to iron. And so the people in Israel didn't really have natural sources for iron, and so they didn't have a lot of blacksmiths. That was one of the things that the Philistines lorded over them. And you can read about that in First and Second Samuel, where the Philistines had blacksmiths who could shape iron, but the Israelites didn't. And when they were in charge, they wouldn't let the Israelites have iron weapons. They'd let them have plows or shovels or whatever, you know, but they wouldn't let them have weapons. Mm. So they kept that technology for themselves so they could beat them in a fight. And also back then, labor wasn't a problem. Yeah, and but skilled all labor. All these nations that conquered all these other nations took their people and used them as slaves. Yeah. Yep. So those, that change in metals back then, part of it was ornamental, like gold. But also one of the reasons gold was very popular back then is because it has a lower melting point. It can be hammered cold, so you can shape it cold. You don't need a forge. And also gold didn't corrode. Right? So gold and silver, they stayed nice a lot longer than copper. Right? You ever see an old penny? What does an old penny look like? Mm -hmm. It's all brown and green, and right? Mm -hmm. Copper corrodes a lot easier. So it, part of it is just rarity, like gold is more rare, but also it was what they could use and how they could make it into stuff and yeah. That's what makes gold and silver worth more money because it's rare. Well honestly, gold and silver's its value nowadays is more just because people think it's fancy. Yeah. Um that's a whole other subject, but some things are are valuable just because people think they're valuable. And some things really are valuable. Like collectibles, it's only worth something if someone else wants to buy it from you. Right. You know. Yeah. Like diamonds. Yeah. So nowadays, in our <laughs> modern society, we use gold contacts on electronics. We use it in circuit boards for computers. Mm. But practically, mostly gold is just used for ornamental stuff nowadays. But back then, they used it for structural stuff. So, like, if you go back and read about the Ark of the Covenant being built, they made it out of acacia wood which is a wood that, that grows in dry climates. Um, so it's very hard, right? So it does, it's very hard and it's very rot resistant. And then they would cover it in gold sheet. Mm -hmm. So you take a rot resistant wood that's very hard and strong, and then you put metal on the outside of it. What do you think a chest that's made of acacia wood and covered with gold, how do you think that would age? It wouldn't. It wouldn't, oh, right? Because the metal will protect the wood, the gold can be polished and doesn't corrode, and you got this hard wood on the inside. So a lot of this was practical stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that was an extra 15 minutes of metallurgy with Pastor Paul. Um, we can talk more about it if you want, but uh, yeah. Any other questions?
Okay. We can talk more metallurgy after I turn this off if you want. But. All right, well, let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the chance to spend in your word, and thank you for this vision that you gave Ezekiel. Father, the timing here really, it really makes us come home. That this was the whole course of his life. Father, to think about a, a young man getting ready to become a priest, carried off as a prisoner, spending 11 years with news of war, spending another 14 years with a city destroyed, waiting on this promise of hope. Like Darlene said, Father, you know, that waiting time is such a hard time. That time between the promise and when we see it start to happen. And we know that Ezekiel didn't get to see this in his life. We know that the rebuilding didn't happen until after he was gone. And so that's maybe a special prayer for right now, Father, for us. That you would help us to have faith and find peace and rest as we wait on your promise. As we wait for these things to come true. Help us to rest in you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, have a good night, everybody, and we will see you in this in two weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. I'll sit here.